Exodus chapter 25. Turn with me there. I'm um, Exodus chapter 25. I, I'm, I'm teaching on worship and wellness where I'm slow walking this in the beginning, but stay close because it's going to really heat up quick, y'all. Um, and we talked all of last week about this issue of sacrifice. Everybody say sacrifice. Uh, and, and, and today I want to go in a little bit deeper. Um, so I want you to turn with me to Exodus 25. I want to read um, from verse 1 down to verse 9 again so we have context for everything that I'm going to talk about. Um, and so just to bring you up to speed real quick, we're learning about the tabernacle. And we're going to spend 12, 13 weeks studying everything in it, how it was built, why it was built, the description of it, and everything having to do with the tabernacle. Understand something. In every book of the Bible, there's a major theme, right? I mean, Genesis is beginnings, and Leviticus is the book of instruction, and Joshua is about conquering, and Ruth is about redemption. And when we study the book of Exodus, it is about deliverance. And understand that that deliverance is not just physical, it is also spiritual. It is also emotional. That we learn here not only God physically delivering his people, but we also learn the tenets and the principles of how God emotionally delivers us, how he spiritually delivers us. Because you do know you can be saved and bound. Amen, pastor. And so there needs to be help around this issue of deliverance. And if we were to study, we were to go back through all of Exodus 20, uh, book of Exodus from the beginning, you, you, you'd see where we didn't, just, we, we didn't just randomly arrive here. Um, God was, and if you're taking notes, jot down the word balance. Everybody say balance. Uh, uh, and it's not in your note sheet, but jot down balance because part of what I need to do to be in a good place is that I have to maintain balance in my life. You know, I can't be too lopsided in one way or another, right? Um, everything should be in moderation. In our Christian life, there should be an element of balance. And when you begin looking at the book of Exodus, this book of deliverance, what we begin to see is that God is really establishing some real boundaries around balance. Because the first thing he does, and I don't have time, and this is not the point of the teaching today, but the Holy Ghost has me starting here for a reason. And so, and so when you go back, say, um, um, after they get delivered, right? They get delivered. They've been taken out of bondage. They cross the Red Sea uh, in chapter number 14. Uh, Moses starts singing this song of deliverance. I've taught that in the past on chapter 15. And then chapter 16, you start to see bread from heaven. Chapter 17, water from the rock. Why is that important, bread and water? The reason it's important is because as God brings his people to a place of deliverance, he says, look, I want you to have good balance. And you can't focus on spiritual stuff if you have unmet physical needs. And we have to recognize as believers, it's great to pray for you, but sometimes I need to give you a sandwich. It's great to be say, you know, lay hands on you, but sometimes we have to meet physical needs. And this is the balance that exists in the book of Exodus around deliverance. And I'm here to tell you, as we talk about balancing worship and wellness, it's difficult to be well if I have physical unmet needs. And people can expect me to come in church and jump all around and be happy and be down with the ministry. It's hard to take notes if my stomach is growling. Come on, it's hard to focus when I know my utilities are about to get turned off, right? And so when you study, when we study the book of Exodus, what we see is that God, first of all, his delivered people, he says, got to make sure if you're going to be well, you have physical needs met, right? Now, notice what happens then. So, so he gives them water, and then there is a shift. I'm just going back through my Bible real quick. And then Jethro speaks, and then um, Mount, uh, Moses goes um, uh, to Mount Sinai. And then in chapter 20, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. Now, he gives them the Ten Commandments, and he doesn't just do that. He starts establishing other laws, right? He starts talking about how you should treat your slaves and how you, uh, laws of social justice and laws of restitution. Um, so he gives them all of these laws, which is the second thing he does for delivered people to bring them to a place of wellness. I'm going to read and get to the handout in a second. He says, not only do you have to have your physical needs met, 
you have to have your social needs met. You got to know how to live with folk. Amen, somebody. Come on. whole bunch of folk good with Jesus, just not with you. Amen. And so the struggle of life is how do we live together in harmony? How do we live together in a way that's going to be honoring to God and empowering to one another? And so as God sets up this story now, this story of deliverance of his people, he says, I'm meeting the physical needs of my people. I'm meeting the social needs of our people. Now we get to chapter 25. And as we get to chapter 25, God says, now here's the deal. The deal is you got your physical needs met. You, you're learning how to live with each other, but don't think just because you got food in the refrigerator and your marriage is good or you ain't killing nobody, don't think for a moment you can still get by without a strong relationship with me. So what he does now is he meets their spiritual needs. That's the balance. I told you to write balance if you were taking notes. Here's the balance. The balance is my physical needs, my social needs, and my spiritual needs. And this is why now Exodus 25, as we move forward, studying the book of Exodus and studying the building, the development of the tabernacle, this is why it becomes so important because it speaks to my spiritual needs. And so chapter 25, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution. We talked in great detail last week about the significance of sacrifice. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linens, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamps, that's verse 6, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, verse 7, onyx stones and stones for setting for the ephod and for the breastpiece, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so shall you make. So here's where I want us to grab why this is very important. Now, let me say again, I apologize, it's not in your note sheets. I, I just want to kind of set this thing up. Two things that I want us to be mindful of about the tabernacle. The first thing is this, the, and it's not in the notes, but the first thing I want us to think about relative to the tabernacle is that it's portable. Everybody say portable. It, 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 it's portable in, in the sense that it, it, it's as they move, the tabernacle moves. Now, let me tell you, this is shout worthy because where are they, y'all? They're in the wilderness. So God is saying, you can both be in the wilderness and with me. Because, see, we live in a culture where people will convince you you're in the wilderness because you're not close enough to God. And we have bad theology that convinces people that your problem is you don't pray enough or your problem is you don't go to church enough. No, I can pray, go to church, and still be stuck in the wilderness and close to God. But this is what he's teaching us. He does not want them journeying too far without connecting with him again. So they are journeying through the wilderness. And this is a great word for us because sometimes the reason we become disenfranchised and frustrated and, and we get beside ourselves is because I journey too long without checking with God. You know, you've been married three years, ain't been back to church. You got a promotion two years ago, stop coming to Bible study. And we have to recognize that if God is going to move in my life, I can't go but so far without checking back in with him, setting up. Get, get, the, get, the, get the image. They have to break it down and set it up so they travel a little bit more. Can you imagine, you know, us having to pack up this whole sanctuary, pack up everything in here as we go on the journey God takes us. And then at the prescribed time, we just stop, set up shop, have worship have the high priest go into the holy place, and after they've gotten an experience with God and the presence of God, they pack it back up and they keep moving. Let me tell you why this matters. It matters because God is because of the portability of the tabernacle that we have to recognize that our relationship with God has to be fluid enough 
It has to be responsive enough to where God is moving me that I never go very far without being able to be with him. One, one, more, one more statement, and then, and then we'll go to the next word in the handout. But here's the other thing that I want you to understand, it's, it's, and this is not going to be a contradiction. It's not just portable, but it's also permanent. Now, that sounds like a contradiction. Why? How is it permanent if they're setting up, breaking down, setting up, and breaking down? Joe, the reason it's permanent is because it is a portrait of Jesus. It is a portrait of redemption. And as I show you all of the furnishings, as I teach you everything that is in the tabernacle, every part of it's going to link us to Jesus. And what he's reminding us is that God is forever present in our journey. And as we walk, as we move, as we advance, as we do, as we progress, as we do the things God is calling us to do, he gives us this constant, permanent portrait of what my relationship with Jesus needs to look like. Now, we talked already about this issue of sacrifice. I won't hash that again. It's so important, and sometimes we get really bent out of shape because I discover that in order to be a good parent, I need to sacrifice. And in order to get a promotion or to get that 4.0 GPA, I need to sacrifice. Tell your neighbor it's not for free. It's not, it just, it, there's, nothing, there's nothing free in this thing, right? And this is where it gets hard for us. And God is setting up from the beginning. You will not be well. Your marriage will not be well. Your health will not be well unless you sacrifice. I'm only going to be but so healthy unless I sacrifice. Amen, pastor. Right? I'm not going to get healthier without sacrificing. We talked about that. Here's the second word I want you to jot down as it relates to this establishment of following God's pattern. Number two, jot down the word specificity. God is teaching us that there has to be some specific things that are asked for. Now, this is very important because he does not leave the initial building of the tabernacle to be or the tent to be whatever they want it to be. He is very specific about the things he wants. And I'm going to say some things here today that I think are going to be really powerful if we really grab a hold of it. So before we get into the notes, this issue of what God asked them teaches them a couple things that I think are valuable for us. The first thing that I think is really valuable for us is that he says, as I lay out all the various types of yarns and the colors and the various things I'm asking you for, he says, I want you to be understand that I'm asking specifically what I want because I want you to develop a standard of only giving in excellence. Let me, let me just park here for a moment. Now, rem, let me remind you, this is worship and wellness. God is saying, when you build something for me, when you come to get in my presence, don't just give me your worst. Now, let me tell you why this matters. Because oftentimes that's what he gets from me. Amen, Pastor Gellier, for those who don't want to say amen. Like, my prayer life is heightened at sickness. I'm wondering, I'm wondering, I'm wondering, why am I not better at praying just as hard when I'm feeling really good as I am praying when I feel really bad. Like, what is it about me? I'm just going to talk about James Gale because y'all don't want to be honest about yourself. What is it about me that I'm not just as excited that I'm having a great day? And I don't get up saying, good Lord, God, the way you have me feeling today, I can't even leave the house right now. I got to talk to you about this because you have me feeling so good today and I'm at the top of my game. No, I don't generally do that. I get up and go about my business. But let me have a headache. Let something be hurting. And then all of a sudden I have time to give him, watch this, the worst of me but not the best of me. And this is why we get so damaged, whether it is relationships, marriage, our parenting, our careers, for our young people that are budding entrepreneurs that are working up your way through the corporate ladder and working up your way through academia and working your way through the ranks of corporations. You will never advance if you give the company the worst of you. But if I give them the best, so he's establishing 
the specificity of the giving has to be giving what is excellent. You know, that this is why I go to bed at a certain time before I have to minister. This is why, you know, Monday nights and Saturday nights is not my hangout time because I know I have to be in front of God's people. And what I don't want to do is come in here yawning. You know, come in here having, you know, giving the devil the best of me. Like I'm partying hard. And then when I get to God, it's like, oh, well, just I'll give you whatever I have left. So he's very specific because he wants to teach them that oftentimes we are not in as well a place because we are not giving the best of ourselves. So it's about excellence in giving. But let me just say one more thing, and I'm going to take you to the handout. It's also about not just giving what is excellent. It's about giving what is important. And, and this is something that is really convicting for me. And remember, I'm going to keep saying this. This is the theme of worship and wellness. What is very convicting for me is how quick and how easy it is for me to give people what I want them to have and not what they've asked for. And if, if marriages are going to be strong and our home life is going to be strong, and jobs are going to look different, and there's going to be advancement and promotion in our life. We have to be sensitive enough to lend an ear, to really pay attention to giving what is important to people. Now, God does something here that I think is masterful. What he does here that I think is so masterful, and this is letter A on the Roman numeral three in your handout. What, what, what God does here that's so masterful, in my opinion, is that he... he he establishes his expectations so they can't get away with disappointing him because he's like, look, I'm going to tell you what I want. Now, jot this down in your notes. The sooner we determine our expectations, then the greater the likelihood we won't compromise. Everybody say expectations. Many, I've learned this. It took me a long time to learn it. We have to learn to manage our expectations. Amen, somebody. So I want to say some things here because, again, I'm slow walking this because I want to link worship and wellness. The whole point of the tabernacle is that they may worship God so that they may be in a well place, that they may be a fully delivered people, a fully delivered people in every regard, physically, socially, and spiritually. Now, in order for them to be fully delivered, God says, I want to be really clear about what I want from you. Now, the reason this matters is because oftentimes we are not as whole as we can be because we're angry with people that didn't give us what we never told them we needed. If this is sounding like a counseling class, it's worship and wellness. And so it is unfair for me to hold you hostage for meeting a need that you never told me you had. It is unfair. And we, we wind up vexing one another, damaging one another, pressing on one another because we are not clear about the expectation. So I, I want to spend a moment on this because I think it is so valuable for us. So God clearly here establishes expectations if... Um, I'll just give this a free, free marital marriage moment, or if you're seriously dating, just receive this for a moment. One of the things that we teach in our premarital class um, is how couples grow through this process. They, they start with, and this is good for married folk, folk good for people in relationship. They start with enchantment. They start with their head in the clouds. Like they start with every day is honeymoon, everything wonderful. Quickly, they get to disenchantment. <laughs> and they start to recognize this wasn't as easy as we thought it was going to be. Which takes, and this is good for your job, which then takes them to the third level, which is maturity. You have to be mature to understand that it's going to take work to get this thing resolved. And most folk, this is why, think about when people leave church. They leave church because they have an expectation that didn't get met. 
And it could be an expectation that nobody told them was going to get met. So they start with enchantment. Man, my life is going to be amazing. I got saved Sunday. My life is going to be amazing. I started tithing. Man, my life is going to be off the chain because I just joined a small group. And then you go to disenchantment. And you start recognizing, wait a minute, we in the same small group and you gossiping about me? Wait a minute, we in the same small group and you trying to, you trying to holler at my husband? And then suddenly it goes to murder. I mean disenchantment. And then when you move from this disenchantment, from enchantment, the people are stuck with, am I mature enough to grow through this moment? And most of us are not, I'm going for it, well enough to grow through the moment. Which is why God establishes this tabernacle as the model for us. So that when we get to this place of totally disenchantment, we can be mature enough to grow through the moment. So let, let, me, let, me, let me ask you to jot down three words that are not in, in, in your note sheet that for me are really valuable. And, and I want to encourage you to do this, and this is going to be in your homework assignment, your small group stuff. I think everything falls into one of three categories. Tristan, the first category that I think, tell me that everything falls in is one, the first category is easy. <laughs> So when you establish your expectations, right, you got to decide, is this going to be easy? Like, so some stuff you're like, oh, that's easy. You know, like if, if there was an expectation for me to cook dinner, for me, that's easy. No big deal. Now, there's a second category, though, because everything that may be required of you is not going to be easy. The second category is effort. Is effort, meaning, meaning I can get there, but I got to sweat. But I care enough about this to put in the work. But then the third category is what I call unwilling or unable. It's a non-negotiable. It's I can't get there. Now, let me tell you why this is important. This is important because one of the most dangerous things we can do is to enter into a relationship having established a clear expectation of something for me that is really, really important, and a person is already letting me know I can't do it, and then trying to force them to produce something that they've already said they can't do. Let me go deeper, and it's unfair for you to be stuck desiring something that's really important for you that can't be fulfilled. You want to know why folk cheat? Because they didn't talk about expectations before they got married. And so he came wanting one thing, and she already had her mind made up of what she wasn't going to do. And the problem is she never said she wouldn't do it because he never asked to have it done because he just thought it'd be no problem. And now they're stuck with, I'm not doing it, and I need it. The same is true with jobs, ministries. So God masterfully, at the onset of the building of the tabernacle, says, I want to be clear about what I'm expecting from you. What I'm not going to do, God says, not going to let you get away with running with me, giving me whatever you want me to have. We're going to talk about what I need from you. Are y'all following me? All right, so, 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 let, 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 me, let me drill, drill down because some of you are like, no, I don't like this teaching, Pastor. It, look, look for a minute. Look at John chapter 14, and I, I think it'll be up there for you as well, but look, look at John chapter 14, verse 6, because I don't want you to feel like this is unique to here. You know, um, the Gospel of John, 14th chapter, Jesus is talking, and, and in verse 6, Jesus says to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, let me stop right there. Jesus is like, look, you don't get to come on your terms. 
So if you think for a moment, I don't like the fact that somebody's establishing clear expectations. Jesus clearly said, you are not getting to God unless you come to me. So God is in the business of establishing very clear expectations. He's establishing what I like to call exclusive truth. And let me just say for a moment, y'all, truth, if it is indeed truth, it is always narrow. Uh Uh-oh. I'm teaching so much better than y'all giving me credit for. I'm going to say it again. Truth is always narrow. And this is where we get offended. Because when people tell me the truth, I try to make it broad. No, no, no. Two plus two is four. That's, na- that's narrow. You, I don't get to make it six. Right? Because truth is always narrow. And this is why sometimes we struggle in life. Because people love us enough to tell us the truth, and then we try to broaden it out and make it something that it's not. And God is saying, no, if you want to come to God, it's narrow. It's the only way you get here. But see, we live in a culture where we want to get in with my broad perspective. No, truth is narrow. You're going to get this degree, these how many credits you need. Now, I'm going somewhere that's important because we accept this as a norm, as a standard in everything else in our life except our spirituality, except, except our involvement in church. It is okay to be narrow. It is okay to establish, I'm not talking, I didn't say unreasonable. There's just some things that can't be broad. Amen, Pastor. So, so, so let, let, let me, let me, let's talk, let me say another thing about this. Our gifts, so he, he tells them what gifts to bring. He tells them what free will offering to bring. He's specific about it. The reason it matters is because our gifts are a representation of us to God and of God to people. Now, that's a mouthful, so let me kind of rewind this for a moment. Remember what is going to happen here. Well, maybe you don't have to remember yet because I haven't taught it yet. But as I teach it, what you're going to discover is that the priest is going to go into the holy place, the holy of holies. When the priest goes in, I want you to get this. When the priest goes into the holy of holies, he is representing the people to God. Y'all got that? When the priests, they're getting all this set up so the priest can go into the Holy of Holies at the building of the tent. When he leaves the people and he goes into the holy place, he is representing the people to God because all the people can't go. Once he has spent time with God and goes out, he is representing God to the people. Now, let me tell you why this matters. Because as you and I offer whatever we offer, whether it is our ministry, whether it is our time, whether it is our energy, oftentimes people don't yet know God. I want you to get this. Sometimes people don't know God apart from your gift. There are people that walk in this room that don't have any relationship with Jesus. They've never opened a Bible. They may not own a Bible. And the first time they get some kind of representation of God is when I stand up and teach, which means for a moment, my gift is representing God to them. Did y'all get that? So that means I don't get to be iffy. I don't get to be unprepared. I don't get to be slothful. I don't get to be lazy. I don't get to be self-serving because my gifts are a representation of us to God. But then it's a representation of God to the people. So then people look at them and say, I mean, y'all, if, you're, if, I'm, if we're doing this thing right, if I'm doing it right, if I'm singing the song right, if I'm playing the song right, if I'm teaching the lesson right, people are going to say this, not look at how good he teaches, not look at how good he plays. They're going to say, look at how awesome God is to give gifts like that. That's what they're going to say. So we have to recognize that God is establishing the value of gifts because 
So let me, all right, some of y'all didn't get it because I can see, I can see over your mask and I can see your eyes looking glazed. So, so, so let me say it like this. We're my parents that want your child to act a certain way because when they leave the house, they represent you. Some of us came from that school, right? Oh, yeah. That, so, so no, no, clean your room because your room represent you. So my office should not be a mess. Oh, hint, hint, staff. Because my office represents, my office is a representation of me and of God. <laughs> I, I feel bad. My, my truck is all messed up right now. And I'm like, I need to do better because it's a representation of God. So he's establishing some specificity here. Sacrifice specificity. These are things that are going to get us to a place of wellness. Really, and it's going to help us with our worship, y'all, right? Then here's the third element. This goes to the balance that I introduced the lesson at in the beginning. The third word that I want you to jot down is on your handout, Roman numeral four, and this really begins at verse number eight, is spirituality. And so there is sacrifice, and there is specificity, and now there's spirituality. Now look at verse eight with me again. I closed my Bible, so let me get it real quick. So, as, if we look back at verse number 8 in chapter 25, he says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell. That word dwell is the word tabernacle, that I may tabernacle among them. It is where our church name comes from. And the word became flesh and dwelt among them. The word became flesh and tabernacled, right? Word tabernacled among them where our church name comes from. So God is saying it is important to me that we are together. Now, this is something that's, in, that's very powerful because I want to link these relationships and these concepts. If you remember in the beginning, they had to make a sacrifice. And in their making a sacrifice, there also had to be an element now that they're making a sacrifice to build something so there can be a dwelling place for God. And, and something that I'm learning, y'all, that I think is very powerful in all of our lives that we, that's going to help us get to a better place, and that is our decisions are always, and I rarely use those absolutes, our decisions are always both sacrificial and spiritual. That every decision I make and some of you can even say every decision is a financial decision as well. Amen, Pastor. I knew I wouldn't get a lot of love on that, but, you know, every decision, let me just say that. Y'all act like y'all don't know that. Every decision is a financial decision. Amen, somebody. Do you think about it for a moment? Buying that house, having that relationship, every relationship is me entering into it saying there's an element of sacrifice and there's also an element of my spirituality an element that shows my growth, my maturity, an element that is showing if I really am where I'm supposed to be in Christ. And, and, and so, and so let, me, let, me, let me give you the next point of this because I want, I want y'all to kind of really grab a hold of this. Why is this issue so important that he sets up a tabernacle in their midst that they can be with each other? Let me tell you why, and this is... <laughs> I think I hope this is going to help somebody. Y'all, remember that they had already made a covenant with God. They had already communicated, hey, we're going to live like you told us to live. We're going to obey these commandments. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Well, once you start living this thing out, it becomes much more complicated to do what you committed to do. You have to be really honest to, to own that. You ever, y'all probably never let, this probably never happened to y'all, but you ever bought something and wish you hadn't? I, I have. I don't know. I, I mean, you just kind of like, mm, it, was, it was a good idea at the time. It's called buyer's remorse. Right, so I thought it was a good idea, and I'm like, well, can I really afford this note every month? Or did I really need these? I want you, I'm going somewhere. It's not always easy to reverse our decisions. 
And so God is saying to them, you've entered into this covenant with me. Now you got to live out what you said you're going to live out. And it's harder than you realize. So I need to make sure we gather together on a regular basis so I can keep you motivated and empowered to do what you said you were going to do. Satan is so shrewd in this regard. Satan knows how to peel us off from the very community that is required for me to meet my obligations. This is why they gather together. This is, this is them gathering together. This is them tabernacling together. This is them dwelling together. So there's a couple things that tell us, that tells us why this is important. Y'all, so, so, so here, here's the first thing. Y'all, the, the, the first thing is, is telling us that places matter to God. He, he establishes a place. And let me tell you why, and I'm not trying to speak this over your life. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. Wherever you are and wherever I am, <laughs> there's still a lot of wilderness left. <laughs> like, we have, we got miles to go, right, before we rest. So, as we travel, as we sojourn, as we go through the wilderness, God is saying, I want to make sure you have a place of worship. And I know it's easy for us to say, well, I can do that in my shower, or I can do that in my car. But the truth of the matter is God has established that we do it corporately as a group as well. And so I want to encourage us to recognize all that places matter. So if you are, if you are right now worshiping right now, studying right now with us on our East City campus, the staff have heard me say that. I want you to hear me say that. That is a place for us. It is not just some random electronic thing. We view it as a place because we know that places matter to God. If you don't believe me, why don't where, where do students go when they want to learn? They go to a place. Where do you go when you get sick? You go to a place, right? So in every other area of our life, we, we recognize the value of places. I don't know anybody that doing surgery on their bed. You go to an operating room, you go to a place. But it's so easy for us to be, and this is why sometimes we are not well. Because we try to sit with our own spirituality and refuse to go to a place to get help. So sometimes I got to go to the counselor, a place. Sometimes I need to go to the office, a place. And so God is teaching us that this issue of wellness and worship is important because places matter to God. Let me, let me teach quickly. I, I got to finish on time today because I have to run out and preach a funeral. And so here's the second thing. Not only do places matter to God, but the other thing that I want us to recognize is presence matters to God. Whew. <laughs> Can y'all handle one of, my, one of my little pet peeves? Because I, see, I don't, I don't know if I should say it because I'm going to offend some of y'all. Gerald is like, come on, man, bring it on. Bring it. Let me tell you what, I just, it's just James Gillia. So if, if I'm talking about you, I'm not. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. When people can't make something, they can't attend, and then their response is, but I'll be there with you in spirit. I, spirits need, that means your body is spiritless. So I'm sorry, I know that sound good, but it's bad Bible. It's bad theology. And what I, what I, what, let me tell you what I think has become, not exclusively, but in some regards. It becomes my way of getting off the hook and not feeling guilty over my lack of effort to try to get there. Not always, but sometimes. Look at what the text says. Verse 8, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst that I might be present with them. Can, can I remind you of something that I hope will be kind of convicting, but like an aha moment? God is omnipresent. Why does that matter? Because he who is king of kings and lord of lords, he who has created all things, does nothing in absence. How is it 
We have become so good at doing not even what God can do, which is, which is do something in absence. He talks about the presence matters. Tell somebody near you, your presence matters. It, and let me tell you something. Sometimes, you know, can I let y'all in on a little secret real fast? Sometimes I'm going to a funeral, I'm not preaching it. But it's important to me that they see me. And so sometimes I'll wait in a certain spot, especially if there's a lot of folk there, because I want the member to know. I want that person in the community to know. I, I'm present for you. I'm not on a program to pray, but presence matters. And I want to shout out all you who spend so much time and effort in our funeral ministry. Because let me tell you something, when that family walks out of the building and all of their family members are around them, no, you didn't preach and you didn't sing and you didn't play, but your presence matters. And some of us, if we were to be honest, just having somebody around us, they don't have to say anything, they don't have to have any answers, they don't have to offer any explanations. All they can do is just be at the table looking at me because our presence matters. God says, I want you to build this because presence matters, and I want you to get this. I want us to be together. Your presence in the tent is going to matter. Imagine whether you're on East City Campus or in the building in Rocky Mount. God's saying every Sunday, I'll be there. I hope you will. Because our presence matters. So when you're trying to get to a place, sometimes your children don't want another gift. They just want your presence. Sometimes people just want you. Can I deliver the room? Start seeing yourself as valuable enough and significant enough to recognize and believe that sometimes all they really want is you. You're that important. You are that important. Put your hands on yourself. Say, I'm that important. I'm, come on. I want you to get that. Presence matters to God. Let us see. i got to hurry up. It is difficult to be what we cannot see. Um, notice what he says in verse 9. I'm in verse 9 now. Exactly. Everybody say Exactly. Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furnitures, furniture, so you shall make it. God is saying, I'm going to, look what he says, show you. Did you? God is saying, it's hard to be what you can't see. That he says, I want to show you the tabernacle. Y'all, can I tell you what our young people need? They need to see us. The sagging pants and no belt is because I don't see belts. And when we can begin modeling it and they can begin seeing it, it's, you know, you've heard me say this, y'all, but when, when I was conducting premarital counseling, I would ask the couples, give me, if you had to draw a picture of the couple that modeled for you the perfect marriage, who would that picture be of? 90% of the time, they have no idea. And then this is what I would say to them. So you trying to be something you've never seen? We, and I'm gonna, this is going to be for our homework. So we have to recognize, y'all, you got to recognize that God is establishing in our perspective of both worship and wellness that it's difficult to be what you cannot see. One of the things that blesses me so much is when I see the four, five, six, seven-year-olds, and they don't fully get, understand, fully worship. Sometimes they do, but they don't fully get it, but they just see mom. And they just know this is the time to lift my hands up. <laughs> they, don't, they don't fully get it yet, but because they're seeing it, they're learning to be it. And then here's the last thing I want to say. Um, that means, therefore, that you and I need to find a pattern for everything we are trying to build. This is why in verse 9, he says, according, concerning the pattern of the tabernacle, God said, I'm going to give you a template. Jot that down in your notes, template. He says, I'm going to give you a template. So in homework, whether you do it with your son, your daughter, a co-worker, a fellow retiree, 
Let's try to learn more from this lesson as we talk to each other. And I want you to ask yourself, um, this is group discussion, who's my pattern? Who's my pattern for marriage if you're a married person? Who's your pattern for singleness if you're a single person? Who's your pattern for family? Who, who's your pattern for your finances? Who's your pattern for business or hospitality? Who's your pattern for home? Who's your pattern for your appearance? Who's your pattern for your health? Let me tell you what I'm learning. I am learning that if I don't have a pattern and if I've not seen it, it's very light, unlikely for me to be it. And so let's establish a pattern, y'all. And so that, that's the lesson to get us started. Now, next week, I'm going to start drilling us into the actual description and aspects of the tabernacle itself as we get to a place of wellness through our worship. And remember, it's about our sacrifice. It's about our specificity. It's about our spirituality. Thanks for listening to Orthos. Hope you enjoyed today's Bible study. If you've got questions or comments or feedback, I'd love for you to share it with me. You can email me at james at jamesgalliard.com. I'd also encourage you to follow me on one of my social media outlets. Go ahead and subscribe, either at Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Instagram. Again, thanks for listening. See you next week.